Okay, hi, this is Mike Billington. I'm with the uh, Executive Intelligence Review, uh, and I'm doing an interview here today with Nabo Jamalich uh, uh, for EIR and the Schiller Institute, uh, as well as for the, uh, the LaRouche Organization website. Um, uh, Mr. Malic is a Serbian-American journalist and commentator who wrote for antiwar.com for 15 years from 2000 to 2015, and since that time has written for uh, RT, although as people know, the um, RT America has one of the victims of the censorship in this country, so, uh, but he still writes sometimes for the, for the home-based RT. Um, do you want to say anything else about your career, Navoja? I've I've insisted for years not to be called a journalist because uh, my experiences uh, back during the Balkans wars of the 90s and since have uh, associated that word with misbehavior uh, in my mm -hmm. mind. And so I, I'd rather may not have called a journalist, but I, it, it technically is what I do. Um, but yes, ever since uh, RT America was forced to close down in early March, I've sort of been a freelancer again after many years of uh, working in the corporate world. Yes, indeed. Okay, well, uh, as you know, the Serbian president, Aleksandr uh, Vucic, uh, recently issued a scathing attack on NATO uh, after NATO scheduled their summit uh, uh, on March 24th. And... Unfortunately, most people don't know this because it's not generally discussed in, in the Western world, but that is the anniversary of the day NATO launched a war against Serbia, Yugoslavia in 1999, which in fact was a sovereign nation in the middle of Europe without authorization from the UN. Uh, and uh, Vucic himself said that that 1999 war was quote, despicable, ill-judged, unlawful and immoral and noted, quote, how ridiculous, even stupid, for NATO to blame Russia for aggression against Ukraine, given its own history. You were in Serbia when NATO launched that illegal war. What, what is the real story behind that atrocity? So um, I wasn't in Serbia, actually, myself. I was already here in the US. Um, I had uh, uh, come over a few years earlier after the end of the Bosnian War. But the 99 war was definitely a turning point in my life because uh, I got to witness firsthand the full, triple Gatling gun barrel of American propaganda that was unleashed overnight uh, when the first bombs dropped on Belgrade. I rarely agree with Vucic on things. Um, I will admit that uh, up front, but this is one of those quotes of his that I fully endorse because that war was a turning point for not just Serbia and the Serbs in general and, and NATO unbeknownst to them, but also for, for Western relations with Russia. And I'm not the only one to say this, and there's been many other people from, from both uh, sides of the planet to, to notice this over the years with different uh, agendas. But on, you know, just to illustrate, uh, a few years later, there was a fellow from the International Crisis Group named John Norris, who wrote a book about, called Collision Course about how the war was not really about Yugoslavia at all, but about sending a message to everybody in Eastern Europe that only obedience to the American model of transition from communism uh, will be tolerated and no, no deviations, such as you know, Serbia's attempt to remain sovereign and neutral. And there was a message to Russia, which was then under the Yeltsin government, well, it spectacularly backfired because this is what brought about a change of um, feelings in Russia, the Yugoslav war, I mean, and pushed Yeltsin out, compelled him to resign, hand over power to Putin. And he'd spent, he spent the last 20 some years basically uh, fighting an in internal war against people who want the 1990s model of, of Russian society to prevail. And so, NATO's war against Yugoslavia lost Russia in, in one sense of the word. What happened uh, at the time specifically is a pattern you will, many people will recognize uh, today, which was basically uh, the U.S. bypassing the U.N. completely, just ignoring it, pushing it aside. Uh, saying, okay, well, you know, we have this peace proposal, there's a humanitarian disaster going on, we're going to use NATO to enforce the peace proposal, to impose it, 
in, in absolute violation of all conventions and international law. And, you know, stop us if you can. And of course, nobody could at the time. And uh, what they ended up doing is for 78 days, they hoped it was only be going to be a week or two. There were private statements by Madeleine Albright and other politicians and mil uh, military officials saying, oh, it's really all over in a couple of weeks. Uh, but they were hoping to get it done very quickly. And it just, they just kept failing at it. So they kept bombing and bombing and expanding the target list to civilian infrastructure and, and bridges and hospitals and uh, so on and so forth. And even that failed. Uh, they tried to get the Albanian military to breach the border. That failed. They tried sending in Apache attack helicopters that mysteriously kept hitting power lines in northern Albania where there aren't really any power lines. And that whole episode is still unclear. Uh, they, they lost us within a week, first week of the war. It was a F-117 stealth fighter that got shot down by a 1970s rocket system that a very clever Serbian um, uh, anti-air operator figured out how to use. And the pilot survived, but the wreck of the plane was, was completely, I mean, the plane was completely reparable and, and there are still pieces of it at the Belgrade uh, War Museum. There was a huge embarrassment. So they just kept ramping up things. And it wasn't until uh, 78 days later when they basically lied and had this Finnish president posing as neutral, but in fact executing NATO orders uh, go to the Russians and say, you know, you need to talk the Serbs into surrendering and in return, we'll get you your own occupation district. And then when, the, when Belgrade decided, okay, fine, we'll, we'll accept an armistice with all these UN guarantees and, and, you know, Russian presence so that it's not a NATO occupation mission because we never objected to a peace, make, peace mission. We only objected to a NATO one because that's blatantly illegal. Uh, NATO said, oh, yeah, we changed our mind. Russians get out. And so, uh, again, this was one of those, um, the, the, I mean, I'm, I'm jumping all over the place, but the point is that uh, NATO at the time used a false pretext of a humanitarian disaster. Um, they claimed that it had been this massacre in a village that the Serbian police and Yugoslav army massacred these innocent ethnic Albanian civilians for no reason. It later turned out by their own forensic pathologists who were kept silent for years, but eventually spoke up when there was no longer fear of repercussions that uh, all of these people that were killed were in fact ethnic Albanian separatist militants who were backed by NATO and who had been considered terrorists until not long before. And then all of a sudden were declared not terrorists because the objective was to fight a war against Yugoslavia uh, on their behalf. And um, they used that as a pretext, that Rajak massacre, to launch, uh, to, to present a peace treaty that was effectively an ultimatum demanding of Yugoslavia, then Serbia and Montenegro, to give up the province of Kosovo because it was supposedly ethnic Albanian land. And when Belgrade said no, as any sovereign country would, the bombing commenced. And again, the point of, it, of the bombing, by the admission of its architects, was to send the message to the rest of the world except that the message that they ended up sending was not the message that they planned. They wanted to, to, this to be, you know, resistance is futile. We are the world hegemon, you will submit. The message that they actually sent was uh, the most powerful military alliance in the world was just held at check for 78 days by a small country left completely alone without any allies, without any sort of military uh, capacities uh, it's the Yugoslav military actually ended up withdrawing nearly unscathed. The all of the, the reporters lining up on the roads out of Kosovo at the end of the war were like, "Where, where are all these tanks coming from?" And then it, it, it turned out that basically they had practiced the art of camouflage and got NATO to uh, expend millions and millions of dollars and you know smart bombs and all this other ordnance into targeting like World War II era tank destroyers that had been sent to Yugoslavia back in the 50s during the Cold War as a gambit against the Soviet Union. They were just simply taken out of mothballs, put up in the fields, painted a little creatively, and NATO was like, oh, T-72s, T-55s, we're blowing everything up. And they were blowing up basically old U.S. ordinance from the 1940s. 
Um, that said, I mean, yes, several thousand people died, including many members of the Yugoslav military and many civilians, um, <clears throat> including some of the staff of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, which was uh, reportedly on this, uh, uh, target, added to the target list by the CIA. And the, the official U.S. explanation was, oops, we made a mistake. But nobody, nobody explained how the mistake was made. The, the, the embassy is very distinct. The maps were very clear. Uh, and it was just simply one of those, nobody was buying the, the official explanation. Uh, China, in particular, has, has remembered the embassy bombing to this day. They just recently commemorated it. And they keep pointing it out as an example of NATO perfidy. Uh, and since 99 to the present day, uh, not, not just whenever it was geopolitically convenient, as the cynics would say, but more consistently than people in Serbia itself, very often, the Russians have pointed out the 99 war as an example of NATO perfidy. And basically that, you know, the West speaks with a forked tongue and they say one thing and do the other, and they don't really mean what they say and watch what they do. So, you mentioned me. you mentioned uh, Madeleine Albright. Um, as you know, she died recently, and Hillary Clinton uh, came to her defense. She said that uh, Albright, who at the time was the Secretary of State, uh, but uh, Hillary Clinton said that uh, she had proved her brilliance uh, by her perseverance in in conducting the war in the Balkans, where despite opposition, Hillary pointed out within the administration and elsewhere. Nonetheless, Madeleine Albright, quote, recognized that the crisis was a threat to the transatlantic region and drove the military assault, which restored order. Uh, do you uh, think there uh, that the situation was a threat to the transatlantic region? And what do you think about Madeleine Albright in retrospect? Well, um, a lot of people. I wasn't among them because I have some sense of decency, unlike most of the Western establishment, uh, celebrated when Madeleine Albright went to meet her maker recently. Uh, she was blamed not just by the Serbs, but credited by the Western establishment for spearheading this war. I have previously written about her case, as well as that of Zbigniew Brzezinski and some other mod more modern politicians, as a case study in which, in why the United States should never let any first generation immigrants and maybe not even third generation immigrants anywhere near the halls of power because they will inevitably use their ethnic grievances and personal uh, agendas uh, to, to hijack uh, the economic, political and military might of the United States for personal gain. Um, I mean, Albright was, was born in Czechoslovakia and, and was actually, actually grew up partly in, in uh, Yugoslavia uh, right before and right after World War II. Uh, her father had sent her over to a Swiss boarding school, but uh, the Korbels, the f her family, uh, were diplomats and her father served in Belgrade uh, on the eve of the Nazi invasion and then returned to Belgrade after the war in that uh, short period be be uh, while Benish was in charge in Prague. And so you had this whole, dear God, we helped her family, we helped her, and this is how she repays us. But, you know, she, she came to the U.S. as a very young girl. She was educated in, in Western ways. She, she, she um, you know, renounced her heritage and, and um, became a family woman and then all of a sudden when she, I, well, apparently she got bored of it in the 1970s and discovered politics and studied under Zbigniew Brzezinski and all of a sudden became this cold warrior crusader <clears throat> i mean it, it it's just one of those people who were like well you know uh, look at what I, she has no memory of belgrade all of her opinions on yugoslavia were basically filtered through Brzezinski and his obsessive hatred of the Soviet Union because he was an ethnic Pole who wanted, uh, who, who wanted a liberated Poland. But what does any of that have to do with the United States is anybody's guess. So again, fast forward past this. The situation in, in Yugoslavia in, in 1998 had nothing to do with the Western alliance. The Bosnian war had just ended. This was, this was late 95, early 96. 
Richard Holbrook was doing his little victory lap of, you know, we ended the war that the Europeans couldn't. Um, NATO had supplanted the UN as the arbiter of international relations, thanks to, thanks to efforts during the Bosnian War by the Clinton administration. Uh, and basically the US hegemony was unchallenged. And it was at this point after Clinton was reelected on the promise that US troops would only stay in Bosnia for about a year, that um, you had Albright and all of these other people going, well, what good is this magnificent military if we don't use it? And they were trying to find a war in which they could be heroes. And they tried with the whole you know, bombing of a drug factory in Sudan. And you know, the, the, that was the early age of Al Qaeda uh, emergence, the attack on USS Cole and uh, the embassies in, in East Africa. And so, but instead of launching a war against terrorism, as George Bush would do a, a couple of years later, they decided, oh, no, 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 no. Let's just go back to the Balkans. We already have assets in, in place. You know, we have this Milosevic guy that we really wanted to overthrow in the first place, but we didn't succeed because he actually was a good negotiator uh, when it came to Bosnia. So what we're going to do is we're going to fund and incite an ethnic Albanian insurgency, which blended you know, anything from Islamism to Nazism, um, and wrapped it up in, in ethnic chauvinism that was rapidly, not just anti-Serbian, but anti-anything that wasn't Albanian. Um, and yeah, the US and NATO are gonna back them instead. And so in 98, when the ethnic Albanian rebellion flared up and Yugoslavia successfully suppressed it, um, then came the, oh, these are not terrorists. And, and if you attack them, we will bomb you. And there was a threat made in late 98, uh, by Albright and, and uh, the administration. And uh, Holbrook went again to Serbia and sat down with the KLA famously. There's a famous scene of him sitting on the floor with, with these bearded jihadists. Uh, <laughs> and then Belgrade was like, fine, you know, send the OSC observer mission, international law, we, we're fine. Well, the OSC observer mission ended up being riddled with intelligence operatives who were literally liaising with ethnic Albanians and helping them set up for a bombing and merely postponed it by three or four months. So, I, and you have the analog situation in Ukraine, you had the OSC mission deployed uh, in, in Donetsk and Lugansk back in 2014, 2015, which would routinely you know, log all of these violations of the ceasefire and say, okay, well, you know, the Ukrainian side fired 150 shells, the separatist side fired five. The vast majority of violations were the pro-Russian separatists. And then that talking point would make it to the, to the White House. And that continued for like seven years before things came to a head this February. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So- uh, let, let me oh, ask, you, yeah. you, mentioned, you mentioned the KLA. I'm sure many of our listeners don't know what the KL is. And the question of so-called Albanian terrorists, what, what is the story behind the KLA and their link to international terrorism. And after the Bosnian war in 1998, when it's time to ratchet up the American empire further, this is the crisis that they latch on to. Not Al Qaeda, not Osama bin Laden, not any of that stuff that's the, the gathering storm on the horizon. No, they decide to fight a war in Europe, declare, embrace the KLA, which you know was in part it was a weird ideological combination because you had people who fetishized the Waffen SS from World War II, the Albanian uh, Nazi collaborators. You had people uh, fetishizing Enver Hoxha and like the Maoist communist uh, Albanian uh, Communist Party from the Cold War. And then you had people you know, essentially like re embracing neo Ottoman stuff and actual jihadists. And all of these people were sort of melded together in a ramshackle coalition of uh, we don't care what your politics are. The more important thing is you're, we're Albanians and we hate Serbs and want them dead. And that's really what their politics were. And the U.S. initially recognized them as a terrorist organization, but in 98 revoked that designation and said, oh, you know, these are legitimate, you know, resistors and, and, and fighters for freedom. And the KLA was actually uh, used to call in targeting information for NATO airstrikes during the actual war, which resulted in incidents such as the bombing of Albanian civilians, ethnic Albanian civilians, 
uh, who were uh, refusing to go towards Albania and Macedonia as the KLA directed them to, but instead were moving inland towards central Serbia. And then NATO was called in to bomb them as military columns. And this happened on more than one, at least two occasions that I remember. And after that, everybody got the message, if you don't do what the KLA says, you'll get bombed. So the KLA is a bit of not nasty business. I mean, they, they've, they've murdered more Albanians than the Serbian police did prior to the war. And especially after the NATO occupation began, they, yes, they targeted non-Albanians for expulsion and murder and, and destruction and pogroms, but they've also committed horrible repression against their own people who weren't you know, deemed insufficiently loyal because they fell, fell out over loot and, and, and power. And you had all of these uh, KLA commanders who later became politicians going on trial before the war crimes tribunal, which was itself a joke, but never mind. And all of a sudden they're like, well, we can't really, we can't really put you on trial because all of the witnesses ended up dead and how that happened, nobody knows. In a very typical, I, I don't want to say mobster fashion because it's an insult to, to, to the Italians, but you know, uh, there, there, there's a whole tribal clan culture of ethnic Albanians, especially in the north of Albania and in Kosovo, that does the whole that blood vendetta thing. And again, a lot of these people ended up dead by, at the hands of other ethnic Albanians to protect the KLA commanders who are still in power. How do you, uh, you, you referenced the Donetsk and Luhansk situation. How do you relate all of this from that largely forgotten wars in the Balkans to uh, what's happened, what's happening now in the Donbass? So I might be, I want to say upfront that I might be slightly biased because obviously we're all programmed to see patterns even where they don't exist. I've actually looked over this several times over the past seven, eight years, since 2014, since this whole thing started. And the fact that I recognize the patterns that some of the things that were happening, a lot of the things that were happening in, in Ukraine matched what I saw during the 1990s in Croatia, in Bosnia, and later in Kosovo, have led me to successfully predict and analyze what would happen next. So back in 2013, when the Maidan protests first arose, I compared them to the October 2000 protests in Serbia, which were a color revolution. One of the first color revolutions successfully carried out by the US establishment. And sure enough, in February, when it looked like uh, the Franco-German negotiated power sharing agreement would result in the president quitting and, and these West, US backed opposition taking over, it's like, oh, it's a color revolution. And then overnight it became a violent coup because they couldn't wait for the agreement, they just went ahead and, and took power by force anyway. Uh, this coup is what literally broke Ukraine because it, it had survived the 2004 Orange Revolution because the people who were put into power then uh, through another you know, effort by the US to win other people's elections as the Guardian described at the time, uh, they could be voted out. Yushchenko and Timoshenko and, and that group were voted out. That's how Yanukovych got back into power. Uh, well, in February, when the coup happened, it became obvious to people in Ukraine that this would not be allowed to happen again. And so this is when you have people in Crimea and people in Donetsk and people in Lugansk and several other regions actually say, okay, no, we don't recognize this government. We want to declare autonomy. You know, we want to keep things the way they were. And this reminded me of the initial um, stages of Yugoslavia's breakup when you had Croatian authorities uh, embracing their World War II heritage, to put a euphemism to it. The independent state of Croatia was a Nazi ally that committed unspeakable atrocities that made even the SS blush. Not to put too fine a point on it. Um, and so you had the modern Croatian government basically say, oh, well, you know, we're, we're abolishing autonomy for the Serbs. These are alien elements in our midst. They need to move. They need to reconcile themselves to becoming a national and minority. We're an independent state where uh, people with a completely distinct history won't, we don't want to have anything to do with them. You know, we're a thousand year civilization that has only uh, been besmirched by these, you know, filthy Orthodox dogs. Wait, no, that was the father of the Croatian nation, Hedante Starcevic in the 1900s. Uh, but, he was 
channeled by these modern day 1990s uh, politicians. And the Serbs responded with uh, setting up barricades and declaring autonomy. Uh, lo and behold, that's exactly what's happening in Crimea and Donetsk and Lugansk all over again. And then to make things even more on the nose, you had Yuri Lutsenko, who was at the time um, an advisor to the Ukrainian government and later became prosecutor general, which, as we all know, is a position that must be vetted by the United States, as Joe Biden so helpfully explained. He basically said, we need to do what Croatia did. We need to arm and you know, pretend to be peaceful and then you know, arm ourselves and train our troops and then wipe them off the face of the earth, just like the Croatia did in 1995. And he posted this on Facebook in 2014. And, and, and this has been repeated by other officials in Kiev ever since. So yeah, obviously there are parallels, except the big difference here is that Russia of the you know, 2010s is not Serbia of the 1990s, uh, not in terms of military power or size or, or you know, ideological confusion in any other respect. And so uh, what ended up happening was uh, that the, um, the war in Donetsk and Lugansk ended up mirroring the war in uh, present-day Croatia, in which the separatists were able to beat back the Ukrainian military and, and set up a border that wasn't entirely the regions that they claimed, but close enough. And uh, there was a standoff and the Minsk agreement, the Minsk agreements, uh, that the two armistices that were signed after both Ukrainian fiascos were supposed to you know, oversee their diplomatic reintegration into Ukraine. And the irony here is that the people in Donetsk and Lugansk were willing to make that sacrifice at the time, even after their own country literally tried to exterminate them as you know, Russian separatists, whatever. They were willing to go back if their rights could be guaranteed and respected. Kiev, on the other hand, absolutely refused, just like Zagreb had absolutely refused to give any sort of autonomy to the Serbs. It wanted the territory. It didn't want the people living on it. And it, you know, all the remaining Serbs in Croatia had been purged. And so what the Croatian events happened within four years, because that was timing that was convenient due to the Bosnian war, but their troops had been trained and equipped by the Americans. They had NATO air cover, and they used this big push in Bosnia to basically launch an all out offensive against uh, the local militia and that had trusted the UN peacekeepers to protect them. And the UN peacekeepers just you know, basically gave up and let themselves be overtaken by the Croatian military and did nothing. And it, this wiped out the UN's credibility, you have no idea, but uh, the UN wasn't even involved in, in, in the Donetsk and Lugansk fiasco because it's been rendered obsolete. And you have this OSCE mission that played basically the same role as I mentioned earlier as the one in Kosovo that was, it was worse than useless. It was basically a fig leaf for a uh, constant Ukrainian shelling of these areas. And you have these repeated requests by, by Russia, but as well as the Donetsk and Lugansk people, look, you know, all we're asking is to implement what you signed. Here's what you signed. Here's what needs to happen. We're ready. We're waiting. We're, you know, uh, after everything you've said and done about us, we're still willing to return, but you got to protect our rights to speak Russian. And, and, and do you have these basic human rights that were guaranteed in the constitution? And, Kiev responded by changing the constitution, absolutely banning Russian in any way, shape, or form. You could maybe speak it in kindergarten, but that was it. And uh, saying, you know, you, you will be uh, brought to heel by one way or another. And when Zelensky himself, who was elected on a, overwhelmingly on a peace platform and stood up in, in the Ukrainian legislature and said, you know, I will do anything for peace. Well, when he tried, when he tried to follow the Steinmeier formula that was developed by then German foreign minister, now president, and he went to Donbass in 2019, he was confronted by the angry Azov Nazis. And I'm sorry, they're Nazis. I'm not using this word lightly. This is the Nazi has been thrown left and right by people who have no idea what it means. But these are the people who literally idolize Adolf Hitler, Waffen SS, tattoo swastikas on themselves. They're Nazis. And they confronted Zelensky and said, no, we won't let you do this. We're the real power in this country. And he returned to Kiev with water, metaphorically water poured on him, 
and basically said, I'll do as you, as you tell me. And he's been running their policy ever since. So what happened, um, honestly, I, I expected what happened in February to go to somewhat differently. I expected, you know, after Moscow recognized these two regions uh, to await the Ukrainian offensive as a pretext and then say, okay, fine, you see what happened. We have an obligation under treaties to defend these people from genocide and we're going to send in our troops. But according to Moscow, the Ukrainian operation was already being planned, including some biological attacks and, and possibly a dirty bomb. I don't know how much of that is true. I've seen evidence pointing to it. The people who dismiss it have never shown evidence debunking it. So maybe there's something there. But the point is that Moscow basically said, you know what? No, seven years, eight years, enough. We're done. We're going in. Now, however you feel about that, that is how the Donetsk and Lugansk situation unfolded. And that's what's fundamentally different because uh, the Operation Storm of 1995 that ended centuries of Serb presence in territories claimed by Croatia never happened. It was not allowed to happen. And there are multiple people in Kiev on the record saying that they wanted it to happen. And there's documents shown by the Russian military suggesting that the Ukrainian military was planning to launch such, just such an operation. So that's the parallels that I keep seeing. You had just, uh, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, the Russians were uh, uh, making very public that Zelensky's government had given them a written proposal for peace, which included uh, the main demand of the Russians before the war started, which was Ukrainian neutrality and no, no joining of NATO. Uh, then you had Zelensky being wined and dined at Western parliaments uh, all over the world, actually. And now, apparently, those agreements have been withdrawn. Mm -hmm. who, who is running Zelensky? Um. Zelensky's definitely run from the West. I don't know if uh, I, until recently, I would have said, suggested from Germany, but no, he's, he's been run by the US. Um, the whole uh, peace proposal thing, uh, demands thing was nonsense. I knew it when I saw it, because if they had been serious about it, they would have uh, done so prior to the outbreak of, of uh, this kinetic war. <laughs> Uh, the negotiations, I thought, were always a, a sham. Uh, and here's why. Um, again, this is, again, me bringing my Bosnia experience into this. During the Bosnian War, you had the government of Alije Zbigovic in Sarajevo, the Bosnian Muslim uh, faction that passed itself off as the Bosnian government, basically saying, uh, you know, we're willing to talk, we're willing to discuss everything. But they had rejected a power sharing proposal that would have guaranteed peace in March 1992, just prior to the war's outbreak, at the urging of the U.S. ambassador. This is what happened. Mrs. Begovic rejected it because he thought it wasn't good enough. He wanted more. The next peace proposal by the U.N. and the E.U., he also rejected because it wasn't good enough. The next peace proposal, he also rejected because it wasn't good enough. There was even a joke told by the Bosnian Muslims themselves joking about is it nothing being good enough for Izabegovic, not even the, the, the most obvious things. Uh, and it, in Dayton, at the end of 1995, when, uh, you know, after the US intervention, the NATO intervention, and, and this, this entire thing, when the Bosnian Serb leadership was accused of war crimes to sideline them so they could talk directly with Milosevic, which whom they thought was more pliable, it, Holbrook himself, He had everything all negotiated, and Izabegovic came into the room and said, no, I don't like this, I won't sign it. And what happened next is covertly, you know, he's not, he doesn't go into too many details, but basically everybody from Holbrook to Clinton himself went, called Izabegovic and said, you know, if you don't sign this, you will lose all of our support. And Izabegovic went, but we're the victims here, you wouldn't dare. He thought that highly of himself. And to Bill Clinton's credit, and I never thought I'd say this sentence, he talked to Zbigniewicz and said, oh, yes, I would, watch me, or something to that effect. Holbrook wasn't entirely clear. 
But he had communicated to Uzbekovich that he's actually in charge of his whole martyr complex. And it's thanks to American propaganda that Uzbekovich was even allowed to consider himself a victim and that he will do what he was told or else. And sure enough, Uzbekovich inks the agreement and the Dayton Peace Accords happen. But they're a worse deal for the Bosnian Muslims than they would have had without the war. And that's not even taking into account all the people that died. So I see the same dynamic playing out in Kiev with Zelensky having a really good deal offered before the war, rejecting it because that's, what, that's either what his masters told him to or what, what he thought he could get a better deal without it. And he started getting high on his own supply and then playing full Izetbegovich throughout, claiming victimhood, you know, sending his foreign minister to Western capitals to round up weapons, himself not getting off the TV screen, you know, talking to parliaments, telling everybody exactly what they wanted to hear, painting himself as this heroic martyr, which is easier for him because he's a 40-something actor, whereas Izetbegovich was an elderly Islamic scholar who didn't speak any English and was, was generally very off-putting personally. And he still got a lot of puff pieces in Western press as a you know, moderate Democrat that was nowhere near the truth. Uh, the man had literally invented the doctrine of Islamic revolution years before Khomeini pulled it off in Iran and, and has been revered across the Islamic world as a scholar of jihad. But, you know, of course, that didn't bother the Western press from making him out something he wasn't. And same thing is being applied to Zelensky. Well, Ukraine can't be nuts because Zelensky is Jewish. He's, he's, I'm sorry, but he played the, the, Jew, the Israeli national anthem with presumably his privates as part of a comedy routine uh, uh, some years ago. Like, uh, how, can you, how can you even square this in your mind? This is not a serious man. Uh, and again, this whole thing has been one incredible act put on for the Western audiences. That was the target audience. And this entire, you know, Ukrainian info war that Kiev is support is supposedly winning is being waged on the Western public. It's not being waged on Russia. It's not even being waged on reluctant Ukrainians. No, it's targeting, it's targeting the United States um, and, and NATO and Australia. And so parallels from Bosnia are, are simply in, uh, unavoidable. You, you literally have Zelensky playing the Izetbegovic script to the last note. And the only thing I'm waiting for is if there's somebody in, in Washington who can, and again, I never thought I'd say this, who would have the willpower of Bill Clinton to tell a client no. The... Um... As, as you know, the airwaves are now full of something with reflections of what happened in Syria not long ago, uh, that uh, Russia and their evil ways are about to use chemical weapons against the innocent Ukraine, I'm um, uh, Bos <laughs> I'm getting caught up. <laughs> yes, in Ukrainians, Bosnia, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the innocent Ukrainian civilians. Uh, as, as everybody now knows, this was exactly the uh, MO of the uh, fake uh, white helmet, um, false flag chemical use by Assad in, in Duma, uh, to, which was then used to justify uh, military uh, air attacks against, against Syria. Um, so not only do you have this so-called chemical weapons of mass destruction, being talked about, always saying we cannot confirm, uh, but it's serious because this is the way the Russians are. Uh, but you also have the fact that President Biden, who before he was elected, said that he would, uh, he would impose a no first strike policy, uh, nuclear weapon, no, no first strike policy, were he to be president, and now has backed, backed off that. Uh, and we have military leaders in the U.S. openly talking about the potential possibility of a nuclear war. So in this context, uh, the, uh, the potential of this Ukrainian fight, which of course has justified the, actually, the actual acts of war uh, by the U.S. against Russia in the form of economic warfare, uh, how do you read the potential that this could break out into a military conflict between uh, 
Russia and, and NATO and the US uh, and potentially with the use of nuclear weapons. So this is where the um, need comparisons with the 1990s break down because Russia is, as I said, no Serbia. This is not 1999 or 96 or 94. And uh, Russia does have a nuclear arsenal that's been um, recently upgraded, tested. Um, there are some um, new missiles even that uh, the West doesn't have or have no, against, no defenses against. And the Russians have been very clear about their doctrine that you know, in case their, their sovereignty is endangered, they will use nuclear weapons to defend themselves. Now, this is not something that seems to be understood in Washington, where they're still clinging on to this idiotic escalate to de-escalate doctrine that nobody ever actually uh, formulated. There's, there seems to be this pattern in Washington that, that, that they're constantly fighting imaginary enemies and, and phantom doctrines, you know, because they'd rather fight a straw man than, than face reality on the ground and prefer narratives of their own creation to reality, however inconvenient. But... To not to put too fine a point on it, uh, there already is a war of sorts between the U.S. and its allies, vassals, however you want to put it, and Russia. Sanctions are war. Economic embargoes, blockades have been long recognized as an, as, as an act of war. So people living in the U.S. should make no mistake, this is war. It's just It just hasn't gone fully kinetic yet because that's what you know, feeding weapons to Ukraine is. But it's a very, very um, slippery slope. There's uh, not very much maneuvering space uh, in, in which the U.S. can uh, pull back from this brink and say, okay, fine, you know, let's just back off and, and, and not use nuclear weapons and end all life on the planet as we know it. Uh, you've got these bloodthirsty... I don't want to call them journalists. They're technically journalists, but they're just bloodthirsty advocates and propaganda spreaders who keep going around on social networks calling for nuclear war, saying it won't be so bad. Why are we so afraid of nukes? These are people who've never felt who, who these are the people who authored the kinds of articles saying I fired an AR-15 AR and it was horrible. You know, these are the people who, who would uh, soil themselves if, if, uh, you know, airdropped in the war zone for five minutes, let alone five years. And here they are pontificating that nuclear annihilation is not so bad because they think it can be won? How stupid are they? Well, in the end, it's, it's, a, it's a rhetorical question because the answer is obvious. But I honestly have very little faith in the capability of the current leaders in the West to avoid a slide into full open warfare because they've repeatedly demonstrated that they don't care for compromise or dialogue or negotiations. They're, they're, they're trapped in this la-la land of their own making, they're believing their own propaganda about how, you know, oh, Russia's gonna collapse after Ukraine defeats them completely. And you know Ukrainian tanks, which at this point almost don't exist, I guess, uh, triumphantly roll into, you know, Kursk or whatever. These people are, are just unforgivably ignorant about what's going on. And, you know, you have this British government leading the way, you know, insisting on all of these sanctions, blockades, boycotts. Uh, who are you people? You're one little island off the coast of Europe that used to have a world-spanning empire 100 years ago. Nobody cares anymore. You're not in charge of the world, unless they are, and they're not telling us. And you've got Joe Biden, who, let's, let's face it, isn't the sharpest tool in the shed, and has never been particularly bright, but at least had possession of his faculties over the you know, course of his lengthy career as a representative for credit card companies. Um, but he, he clearly doesn't know what's going on. And he's being fed lines to say, so one, one week, he'll say war crimes and the next week he'll say genocide and it's all this stuff that's coming out of Kiev and nobody's checking him on this and we have to rely on people like Jake Sullivan you know who used to be Hillary Clinton's errand boy for for all sorts of political wet work to to keep him in check and you know back, walk back his his uh you know public announcements to the pliant white house press it doesn't exactly instill confidence 
I mean, I'm, I would hope that there are people at the Pentagon who are willing to put, you know, push, pull the brakes and say, look, 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 look. No, we're not getting involved in a nuclear war with Russia because that's insane. But, you know, do, do I really think that Raytheon General Lloyd Austin and, and Bok Mark Milley have it in? I don't know. You know, you mentioned uh, the fact that these, uh, these incredibly severe economic sanctions are in fact an act of war. Uh, many people are admitting and pointing out, even Joe Biden for that matter, that these sanctions are having uh, as much or even more uh, devastating effect on Europe and the United States than they are on Russia. Uh, the Russians are working with China and recently India has, has quite openly joined with them uh, to put together alternative financial measures to counter the, uh, the belief in the West that because they control the dollar, uh, they therefore can control the world and impose sanctions on anybody who does trade. That now is being challenged uh, by the discussions to set up alternative financial systems. Um, the question of why they would impose these sanctions, knowing they would have such a devastating effect on the West as well, brings into question whether or not that in fact was their intention, that we're dealing here with a Malthusian policy, the old British imperial Malthusian policy, uh, which says, let's keep the world in a state of backwardness in order for we, the aristocrats and oligarchs to uh, to have our way, uh, the difference being, as you pointed out, that Russia is no longer the weak country it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. And of course, China has totally transformed into one of the leading nations uh, in, in history, really. Uh, so the, the question here is, what will it take for those in the West uh, to come to terms with the reality that this is no longer a unipolar world with uh, the city of London and Wall Street being the gods of Olympus who can dictate the policy to the entire world. What, what will it take to change that in your view? So it's already obvious to me when I look at the world today that you, um, you have these US diplomats, and I use the word in air quotes because they're not, going around the world and telling everybody, you must do this, you must do that. And everybody else politely but firmly says, no, we won't. You, you've, you've got the Indians saying, yeah, yeah no, no. Yeah. You give us grief over oil imports from Russia, but we import less oil in, in a month, in you know, a year than, a, than the Europeans import in a day. And we don't see you having a problem with that. You have the Chinese going increasingly um, the, the Chinese are very fond of, of uh, diplomatic formulas, and they're becoming much more blunt by that day in this, in this crisis. Uh, you have the Russians, who are also very fond of diplomatic forms, becoming um, about as blunt as Serbs these days. Uh, but you, you have, the, the, you know, this whole, oh, the international community and the world have isolated Russia. No, you and your 40 uh, vassals or the international community. And everybody else is either saying, we don't want any part of this. Most of Africa is like, this is not our fight. <clears throat> uh, and then you have India and, and you have China. There was recently a uh, regime change operation in Pakistan after Prime Minister Imran Khan said, oh no, we want to continue trading with Russia and China. And basically US diplomats went and talked to the opposition and said, vote this man out, you know, give him an unconfidence vote in the parliament. And there was this whole back and forth and Khan was ousted because this is what, this is what the US does. All this rhetoric about, you know, sovereign nations get the right to choose their alliances. This is nonsense. This is a lie that the thing that they used in the run up to the conflict saying, oh, but Ukraine is a free and sovereign country. It can freely choose its future. Only, only if it makes the correct choice and the only correct choice is to, to submit to the globalist American empire. This is not controversial. This is a fact. This is what they think. This is what they want. This is how they act. And the rest of the world, with all of its stand and troubles, is aware of this and is trying to act accordingly. Now, some people are being very subtle about it because they don't necessarily want to get attacked. But 
I, I believe, especially after last year's fiasco in Afghanistan, there's a growing awareness in the rest of the world that maybe, just maybe, the Pentagon isn't all, all that all powerful as it paints itself to be. And perhaps, you know, one can stand up for their sovereignty without being trampled. That was what Serbia was supposed to serve as an example because of the 70 day war, uh, 78 day war in 99. But when NATO failed to make an example of Serbia militarily because the war itself was inconvenient because Serbia resisted successfully, they ended up making Serbia into another type of example with the color revolution. And that's the example they've been using around the world. If you, if you don't behave, we'll go in, we'll use your elections, we'll subvert your democracy, and we'll elect people who will serve us and obey. Now, to, get, to address what you just mentioned about the sanctions undermining the West itself and, and wrecking the dollar's position as a reserve currency and undermining faith in the entire Western project, because I'm sorry, you know, the, the whole Western claim to global hegemony is supposed to be based on these universal values, right? Private property, democracy, freedom, free speech, etc. And all of this is being trampled, all of it, with wild disregard for any sort of laws, norms, traditions uh, in, the, in, in response to events in Ukraine. Well, what gives? And you have two explanations. One explanation is that the people in charge are so stupid that they don't see what they're doing and they can't see second order consequences and that they think that, you know, cutting off uh, access, uh, Russian access to iPhones is going to collapse their society. It might collapse American society if that happened. But they, so is it, is it that they misunderstand Russia and are basically projecting um, American society onto them? Or second explanation, which you also offered, is that this is a deliberate ploy to wreck the world, and deliberately uh, sink it into poverty and, and despair. It's sort of a great reset, if you will, championed by some luminaries of the World Economic Forum, which we know have been in contact with um, all sorts of politicians in the West, not just those in power, but also those in opposition, which would explain why there's no political opposition to any of this madness, or hardly any. And so, and of course, you, you have these World Economic Forum people promoting the Great Reset for the past two years of the pandemic. Oh, great, you know, pandemic. Uh, now we need to do what we've always intended to do, only faster. Uh, oh, great, Ukraine. Now we need to do what we intended to do, only faster. Like, literally everything can be harnessed to serve their agenda. And it's, it's tempting to, you know, write off Klaus Schwab as a Bond villain, or you know a, car, a, a, a cartoon baddie, but if if you know if the shoe fits, I mean if if observable reality matches their their public statements, then surely we must think that there's something there. And now, obviously, it, it's coming to a head. All of this, all of these things are are you know all the masks are off, and you can literally see that this entire establishment that purported to you know govern the world in a benevolent hegemony for the benefit of all and prosperity and human rights and democracy doesn't really value any of these things. They only value power and only their own. And they don't really care. They talk about a rules-based international order. There's no international order. It's only whatever they decide it is. There's no rules. They make the rules. They're above the rules. And they expect this to be okay with, you know, 8 billion humans on earth or however many there are now. I've lost count. And it's very clearly not okay. Um, it's, it's very clearly not okay uh, in, in most of the rest of the countries outside of this you know, US block, but also no, in, internally, you've got hundreds of millions of Americans not agreeing uh, with the government tyranny at home. They just, you know, they just get propagandized to worship the latest hero on TV. And, you know, Zelensky is the Andrew Cuomo of, of Anthony Fauci's at this point, but tomorrow it may be something else. But, you know, you've had Canadians standing up against mandates. You had Australians demonstrating. You had, you know, people in, in, in Europe. No, you, these, these people do not have the mandate of heaven, the mandate of God, the, the mandate uh, at their own ballot box to do this to the world. They just don't. He, as you know, Lyndon LaRouche always uh, throughout his life uh, argued that the, the idea that the British Empire 
uh, disappeared and the American empire took its place is a fundamental misconception of, of history that the British empire uh, never dissolved. It was always a empire of the private sector of the banking interest in the city of London. Uh, the, the East Indies Company was a private company running the empire. Uh, and that, in fact, what you saw in, in, instead was that the U.S. Of, uh, of, of Washington, Hamilton, Abe Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt was torn apart and replaced by the British model using the U.S. as the dumb giant to maintain and continue the British imperial colonial policies in Vietnam and then in the Middle East uh, and so forth. Um, the, uh, the role of the British here, as you indicated earlier, and in fact, what's really behind the World Economic Forum and the Great Reset that you mentioned are Prince Charles, uh, uh, Tony Blair, um, the uh, uh, Mark Carney, the head of the former head of the Bank of England. Uh, how do you see this this British imperial role today, and and uh, and what is required if we're going to end once and for all this era of imperial might? Well, oh, it's it's been obvious to me. You know, you you have on the surface this whole oh, where the British Empire ended at the Suez Crisis, and you know, uh, the U.S. replaced it. But that's such a surface reading of history when it becomes obvious that Churchill himself wanted the U.S. to get involved in World War II, just like the British got the U.S. to get involved in World War I, uh, to save its own empire. Now, Churchill wasn't stupid. He was many things, but he wasn't stupid. And would you really believe that he wanted the Americans to come in and take over and, and destroy the British Empire? No, of course not. Um, I think a quote comes to mind from a great movie that the greatest trick the devil ever pull, pulled off is convincing humanity he doesn't exist. Um, I think one of the convincing greatest, who the devil the greatest trick devil pulled off was convincing humanity he doesn't he didn't exist. Right. I believe it was from the Usual Suspects. <clears throat> uh, but I think the greatest trick that that London has pulled off is convincing the world that Britain is no longer an empire. Uh, you know, pulling the strings around the world. It may not be the same, you know, Victorian empire in which the sun never sets, but it, it literally still pulls the strings all the way over, all around the world, as we've seen from the disproportionate influence of, of Tony Blair or, or, you know, whoever is the current occupant of 10 Downing Street. I've, I've lost track. There's been so many lately. Uh, but you have these people like, I just remember um, a few months back, their foreign minister, Liz Truss, going to Moscow would meet with Sergei Lavrov and him asking her a basic elementary geography question and her just running into that rake in front of God and everybody, you know, saying that she will never recognize Voronezh as a part of Russia and it's been part of Russia since forever because she doesn't even know which regions of Ukraine she's supposed to be championing. I mean, this is the kind of caliber of people that are that are in official positions. They're not very bright. And yet they bark and the entire world barks with them. Well, what gives? Something's got to be going on there. Because as I said before, here's this little island with a relatively modest economy of, of you know, industry or anything. All they've got is entertainment and banking services. And yet... So much of the world bows to their influence like it's 1898 instead of, you know, 2023. And it makes no sense. Why? Well, you tell me. But, I mean, one of the first things that I would change and what people should have done a long time ago, because there's plenty of warning and, and people fall for this every time. What, anybody who keeps their gold in the Bank of England is a moron. And it's an offense to morons. I'm thinking Cretans and dweebs at this point, because seriously, how many countries' wealth has, has the UK confiscated over the years? Every time. So it's like, oh, well, you know, they've taken it from the Iranians, but they won't do it to us. Oh, they've taken it to Venezuelans, but they won't do it to us. Oh, did, come on, seriously. How many people does, does, does London have to rob blind for you to realize that it's not safe to keep gold there? It's just not. 
again, if if Britain is this, you know, shadow world empire of bankers and propaganda, and don't get me wrong, it seems propaganda is a huge factor in this because they may not have much of a real economy, but they definitely have the biggest psyop army in the world, which, by the way, exists to accuse Russians of doing that. How, this is being financed by people stupid enough to put their money in the city of London. Basically, I'm not saying this is our fault for enabling them, but it's our fault for enabling them. All right. Well, so uh, I think you you uh, have signed the petition which the Schiller Institute has circulated, or if you haven't, I, I hope you will, uh, which is called uh, Convoke an International Conference to Establish a New Security and Development Architecture for All Nations. Uh, and that petition asserts that the world is at a conjunctural crisis, which you've made very clear here today. Uh, which will either lead to war or to a new paradigm based on the notion of peace through mutual development, as in the 1648 Peace of Westphalia, which ended the uh, 150 years of religious warfare in Europe by, uh, by establishing sovereign republics in which each republic's interests were, were also those of the other nations and that all past crimes were forgiven. Uh, uh, this, of course, would be the only sane approach to uh, ending this rush to war, could be nuclear war, rush to global economic disintegration and mass starvation, which is already uh, facing mankind. Um, but the question is, uh, how can we get this Western world now dominated by this uh, out, outrageously imperialistic and Malthusian mentality. Uh, can we, uh, through this approach, which we've proposed, and by the way, which we also held a very powerful conference this last Saturday, demonstrating that it is possible that the Russian ambassador to the U.S. stood up with Helga Zepp LaRouche and the Schiller Institute to declare that we must bring about this kind of a new paradigm based on peace through development uh, and others from India and from, uh, from China and from South Africa and from South America, uh, that this kind of bringing the world together rather than uh, in a state of geopolitical conflict is literally the only way to escape this descent into a new dark age. What, 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 are, you, what are your views on, on that? Uh, it sounds, it certainly sounds like the kind of great reset that I could get on board with, um, mm -hmm. because uh, it, it's not enough to just condemn the current situation as untenable. Uh, we, we do need to propose solutions to it. And I think um, the, the Russians and the Chinese have uh, several months ago committed themselves to an actual world order based on international law. Um, which, you know, for all of their, all of this talk in Western press about their being revisionist powers, they're not. They're actually standing for the world order as written, the, the laws as on the books. And it's the Western powers that seek to operate outside the law and uh, hold themselves exempt from obligations that they insist on imposing on others. And I think um, the, 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 um, blind alley in which, we're, we're, which we find ourselves today, uh, in, in which um, the conflict in Ukraine that was from the very beginning engineered to target Russia as a sovereign nation. This is not about Ukraine. It never was. The United States doesn't care about Ukraine or its people. They care about using Ukraine as a weapon against Russia. And the reason they want to use a weapon against Russia is, again, goes back to the 90s and, and the doctrine that you, there can only be one sovereign country in the world, the American empire. And everybody else is either a servant or a victim or yet to be victim, but pretending to be a partner for now. And that's, that's how they run the world. And this is obviously not tenable. It cannot go on forever. It, it's not, not about to go on for very much longer one way or the other. And so we need to start thinking about a new vision of the world that would replace it, that would, that would be more in line with objective reality, that would uh, guarantee principles that are valid for everyone, and that would be 
that wouldn't require an enforcer able to commit monstrous acts in order to keep people in line, but would rely on the goodwill of the people, the, of, the, of the people being governed themselves, of a true international community, much as that word has been defiled by propaganda over the past 30 years, to actually see, an, there will always be conflicts and disputes as, as, as long as there are human beings and humanity. But being civilized means having a way to adjudicate these disputes in a manner that doesn't destroy lives, that doesn't destroy families or communities or even entire civilizations. Um, and, you know, we call ourselves a civilized world. Let's be about it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Do you have any uh, sort of final words for uh, the uh, for followers of EIR and the Schiller Institute? Um, just what I said. We we call ourselves a civilized world. Let's uh, let's be about it. Let's. Uh, I, I encourage people to uh, read your daily updates. They're very informative, and uh, uh, learn more about your mission. Um, it, it's very intriguing and offers a lot of interesting uh, solutions that I think people would, uh, uh, would do well to study and implement. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, this you. will have a, a very wide impact, I, I'm certain. Thank you for having me.